March 18, 1944, episode 100. Tens of millions are dead, the world is broken, the global economy has gone off a cliff, everyone is exhausted. You might think that by now things would be slowing down. You would be wrong, because this is 1944, the bloodiest year of the war. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. I'm back after a much needed couple of weeks break. Here's what happened while I was away. In Poland, the Home Army's ongoing armed uprising, Axia Buja, Operation Tempest, continues. There are multiple attacks on German troops every day. They blow up trains, tracks, attack transports, police stations, even fighting outright battles in towns dominated by the German occupying forces. The conflict within the United Nations alliance regarding the future of Poland's border with the Soviet Union and Germany has not been resolved, but the Western Allies' unwillingness to step in on Poland's side continues to deepen. After a Soviet de facto dictator Josef Stalin finally and firmly rejects any negotiations on March 3rd, the British and American governments grow even more reluctant to provide material help to Operation Tempest. Instead of attacking German troops outright, they want the Home Army to focus on sabotaging communications. The Polish government in exile fears that such a wind-down might further expose them to a Soviet takeover. On March 11th, General Inspector of the Armed Forces in Exile, Kazimierz Sosenkowski, messages Tadeusz Borkomorowski, the leader of the Home Army. The Allies have approached us suggesting preparations for action against communications. The political situation may render such action necessary from our point of view to demonstrate our goodwill in respect to the friends. We are ensuring secrecy at our end to prevent the Soviets from taking propaganda advantage for themselves or placing any obstacles in our way. It's not a completely unwelcome change to Komorovsky. The slowdown of the ongoing Soviet counteroffensive in the northern half of the Eastern Front has allowed the Germans to reinforce on their side of the frontier that is now inside Polish territory. And by the second week of March, Komorovsky has to reduce his attacks anyway. That, however, doesn't lead to a reduction in German reprisal killings that are also daily. The worst massacres are on February 27th at the Auschwitz concentration and extermination camp when 163 Polish resistance members are murdered in the gas chambers, on February 28th when German aligned forces murder up to 1,200 civilians in Huta Peniaska, and on March 12th when German troops aided by Ukrainian nationalists burn the village of Plikorov near Lvov, killing 385 people. This cycle of resistance and reprisals is spinning faster and faster all over occupied Europe. In Greece, the civil war between the republican and monarchist forces of Edis and Eka and the communist forces of Iam and Elas is put on hold with the Treaty of Plaka on February 27th. Although Edis has no intention of honoring the agreement mid-term, for now both sides can focus on attacking the German occupier and organizing humanitarian aid to the civilians. Between March 4th and 10th, Elas forces and the Germans battle over the region around Kokinia. When the Elas forces prevail and the Germans are forced to retreat from the region, the Germans take revenge by murdering 32 of the 300 civilians they capture during their retreat. On March 1st, tens of thousands of Italian workers in the German fascist puppet state in northern Italy go on a week-long strike organized by the Italian resistance. The Germans arrest around 2,000 workers, deporting many of them to the concentration camps outside of Italy. In general, Italian partisan activity is on the rise, as are German reprisals. On March 18th, the 1st Fallschirm Panzer Division Hermann Göring shelled the villages of Monchio, Sozano, and Costignano near Monte Fiorionno to repress partisan activity there. After the rain of bombs, they enter the villages and slaughter the inhabitants. 129, all civilians, including women, children, and the elderly, are murdered. In France, sabotage, disruptions, and attacks are also daily by now. Here, in order to prepare for the planned invasion this coming spring, the British and American secret services are offering more and more help. Again, the Nazi answer is to step up their oppression, suppression, and repression. In Lyon, on March 3rd, the head of the local Gestapo, Klaus Barbie, the Butcher of Lyon, orders anyone even vaguely suspected of resistance activities arrested. In a sweeping operation, hundreds are taken to the Gestapo torture chambers and then on to concentration camps. 
in general, the operations of the US OSS and the British SOE to seed resistance, sabotage and intelligence gathering are now on the rise. Agents and arms are being dropped into Slovakia, occupied Yugoslavia, Greece, France, the Netherlands and Norway. As a result, in occupied Czechoslovakia on March 12th, the Czechoslovakian government in exile calls on all civilians to rise up against German occupation. With renewed fighting in Burma, South Asia, the SOE also step up operations at their headquarters in Calcutta, Bengal, British India. On March 16th, their units there adopt the name Force 136. Meanwhile, the Soviet partisan activities along and behind the Eastern Front are also increasing everywhere. The Nazi answer is the same. Like when on March 18th in the city of Ribnita, Romania, German soldiers massacre close to 400 anti-fascist prisoners of Soviet and Romanian citizenship. But there is also a rising number of German military officers that have had enough of the Nazi party's wasteful war. On March 11th, one of them attempts to murder German Führer Adolf Hitler. Hitler is at the Berghof in Berchtesgaden. When he calls a group of officers together for a briefing, Rittmeister Eberhard von Breitenbuch brings a concealed pistol with the intent to shoot the Führer. But the meeting ends up being held with higher-ranking officers only, and the SS guards refuse to let Breitenbuch enter. He leaves without his intentions having been revealed. Germany isn't the only Axis power committing strings of atrocities at the end of February and in the first half of March. The Western Allies' advance on or past several islands in the Pacific is forcing the Japanese army to abandon their positions. On February 29th on Truk, thinking the American forces are about to invade, the Japanese units try to destroy anything they can't carry with them as they flee. That includes 70 sex slaves or comfort women they have held for their carnal and sadistic pleasures. Instead of bringing them or just abandoning them, the Japanese line them up and murder them by machine gun. Five days later, in occupied Rabaul, on the island of New Britain in the territory of New Guinea, 31 prisoners of war are led out of their cells. What happens next is a mystery. The Japanese guards will later claim that the prisoners were taken to the area around the Talili Bay, where they were all killed by an errant bomb from a U.S. plane. That story fails to add up on account of no planes flying in that area in this period. A more likely but unproven version of events is that anticipating an invasion, the POW are massacred. If the Japanese are indeed expecting an invasion of Rabaul, they are mistaken. The Allies have decided to isolate and bypass the port, but they will neutralize it from the air. By March 10th, the US and the Japanese both estimate that 60% of Rabaul is now destroyed which, since almost every civilian is long evacuated, is the destruction of a purely military target. Things look different in many parts of Europe. The desperate bombing campaigns continue and have still not brought any decisive victory on either side. The cost in human lives mounts and mounts. On March 3rd, the British government tallies the dead of the war so far and find that the number of British civilian mortal casualties 50,324 have surpassed the British military deaths that stand at 50,103. But the Germans are desperate for more deaths in revenge. Desperation evidenced by a meeting at the Berghof between the Führer and the only German female top aviator, Hannah Reich, on February 28th. Operation Steinbock to retaliate on the British has by now largely failed, although some sorties are still being flown with little effect. One of the many issues is the total lack of accuracy. Reich, in what I would imagine is a dizzying rush of Nazi ideological fervor and zest, suggests to Hitler that specially designed versions of the V-1 flying bomb should be created. A piloted version. So a suicide squad. And Miss Fritsch wants to be one of the pilots. Hitler isn't impressed by the idea, perhaps because his V-weapons, the Vergeltungswaffe 1 und 2, without pilots even, aren't ready to be deployed yet, despite the tens of thousands of slaves being worked to death to complete them. The reign of bombs in these weeks are instead still from conventional bombs. The U.S. Army Air Force continues the present strategy of trying to knock out German aeronautical industry, but continues to mostly hit other things civilians, and losing dozens of planes and air crews. Even if they do hit factories, the unfortunate victims are often people enslaved by the Nazis. 
On March 9th, Reichsführer SS Heinrich Hemmler informs Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring, head of the Luftwaffe, that 36,000 prisoners are now enslaved to produce for the Luftwaffe and that he is entertaining plans to increase that number to 90,000. RAF Bomber Command's serial bombardment of German civilian targets is also marred by difficulties. Heavy opposition from the Luftwaffe and bad weather get in their way in the two major raids on Düsseldorf and Stuttgart flown in early March. Despite that head of Bomber Command Arthur Harris and US head of the Combined Bomber Forces Carl Spatz are heavily opposed to using their bombers to strike transportation hubs, transports and manufacturing plants in France as preparation for the Allied invasion, on the insistence of Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force Dwight Eisenhower, several minor and medium raids are flown over France by the RAF. The goal is to see if Harris and Spots are right, that heavy bombers are ill-suited for the job, and to see if the fear of massive civilian casualties can be avoided. In Melun les Meurs on March 2nd, Trappe on March 7th, Le Mans on March 8th and 14th, Marignan on March 10th, Amiens on March 16th and 17th, and Clément Ferrand March 17th, the results all look the same. They can hit factories, trains, marshalling yards, and railways, but the lasting results are unclear, and each time dozens of civilians are killed. On the upside, it looks like bombing France would be significantly less costly for the Allied air forces, as Luftwaffe and anti-aircraft opposition is less harsh. The outcome stokes the flames and the debate of what to do. Neither the political fear of causing the French to be alienated, nor the pragmatic cost and effect calculation to meet Eisenhower's goal, nor Harris and Spot's opposition are settled, and no final decision for how to prepare for Operation Neptune, D-Day, has been taken by mid-March. A decision that is taken regarding Neptune on March 12th is to ban all travel from the United Kingdom to and from neutral Ireland. Two days earlier, the US had asked the Irish to expel all Axis diplomats, which they refused. Although neutral, and with many volunteers fighting for the Allies with British forces, Ireland has sizable elements who have toyed with supporting Nazi Germany. The Allies fear that Ireland may be used as a gateway to smuggle out intelligence about events in southern England, events that may give away the secrets of the upcoming invasion. On March 14th, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill announces in the House of Commons that Ireland will be militarily isolated to stop any such intelligence traveling through the country. In the Soviet Union, travel is mandatory for some. Travel to Siberia. It's travel or die, often both. The ethnic cleansing of the Chechen and Ingush populations concluded within one week, with the last transports leaving in early March. As those transports are still being filled on February 27th in Khaibak, the NKVD troops there decide that they won't be able to get 700 men, women, and children to the transports in time. Instead, they massacre them by locking them up in a big stable and setting it ablaze. On March 3rd, Stalin then disbands the Chechen Ingush Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic, making the region a simple oblast within the Russian SFSR, populated only by ethnic Russians and Ukrainians. The next day, the orchestrator of the events, head of the NKVD, Lavrenti Beria, is awarded the Order of Suvorov First Class. The newly decorated comrade already has his next ethnic cleansing project in preparation. On March 8th and 9th, he has all Bakars in the Caucasus region of Russia rounded up. In all, 14 trains bring 37,713 men, women, and children to the inhospitable lands further east in Russia. Like so many times before, many will die on the journey and more will die from exposure, starvation, disease, and exhaustion after they arrive in their barren new homelands. For them, there is no escape. In Germany, some POW do try to escape. In fact, quite a few Allied POW have managed to break away from their German captors. Now, Trying to escape, or escaping, is pretty much expected from a prisoner of war. Accordingly, international law dictates that even repeated escape attempts shall only be punished by disciplinary actions. Himmler doesn't agree. On March 2nd, he decrees that all recaptured SKPs shall be sent to Mauthausen concentration camp to be executed on arrival, with their remains destroyed in the camp crematorium. 
The very next day, a transport of 1,390 prisoners, mostly Latvians and Russians, is sent from Stutthof concentration camp to Mauthausen. Several of them meet Himmler's ordered fate, and of the survivors, many, most, will not survive the camp. On March 7th, Himmler tightens his orders by dictating that no one shall be released from Mauthausen. Not ever. His boss, Herr Hitler, issues orders of far greater magnitude five days later. On March 12th, he orders the occupation of Axis Allied Hungary. You can see in these episodes for how these events unfold. The occupation that begins on March 18th spells doom for 750,000 Jewish Hungarians who have so far been spared from Nazi genocide. That doom is already being wrought down on people of Jewish ethnicity and the other recently occupied Axis nation, Italy. On March 3rd, the German security police in Italy requests the Italians to assist in the enlargement of the Fossoli transit camp since the number of people held is constantly rising as arrests ramp up. The Italians agree to support in the construction work. But Four days later, the German occupiers arrest elderly people in Jewish hospices in and around Turin, and the Nazis have also used their bizarrely obtuse definitions of who is of what ethnicity to arrest family members of non-Jewish Italian families. People the Nazis consider Jewish anyway because of ancestry. Now, going after the elderly and people in their own families are not popular moves with the Italian people. So the same day as a hospice arrest, the Italian fascist puppet government issues an order that people over 70 and people of mixed ethnic heritage shall not be arrested, an order the Nazis will willfully ignore. On March 1st, another potential path for escaping European Jews trying to avoid this fate is restricted, when British High Commissioner in Jerusalem Sir Harold MacMichael announces that the current quota of 75,000 Jewish immigrants will not be increased. When the current quota expires on March 31st, there is no plan for further openings for immigrants. Inside occupied territory trying to help Jewish fellow human beings is becoming increasingly dangerous. Like in Poland, when 38 Jews hiding together in a location in Warsaw are discovered and arrested. The six Polish non-Jews sheltering them are also arrested. Among the arrested is historian and chronicler of the Warsaw Ghetto, Emanuel Ringerblum, and his family. Both non-Jews and Jews are taken to the ruins of the Warsaw Ghetto and murdered within days of their capture. The systematic industrial-scale murder continues at Auschwitz. Between February 27th and March 18th, two large transports arrive, one from the Netherlands and one from France. 445 adults and teenagers are enslaved in the camp. 1,788 men, women, and children are murdered in the gas chambers. This comparatively low amount of new victims arriving in this time period is, however, not a slowdown of the murder rate. The Nazis are simply busy with one specific mass murder. For years, the Theresienstadt ghetto in occupied Czechoslovakia has been used as a propaganda tool to show a false, less harsh treatment of the Jews to the world. The Red Cross and foreign dignitaries have been taken to the model camp and its close to 100,000 inhabitants. Although far from humane, in fact mortally inhumane, some 33,000 people will have died there by the time it closes, the ghetto has, in comparison to other ghettos and camps, been held with a greater amount of leniency. In September last year, as the number of Jews in Eastern and Central Europe left to murder had dwindled, the SS decided that the ghetto was to be gradually liquidated and its inhabitants murdered. To not break the illusion of Theresienstadt, the deported were instructed to write letters telling their relatives and friends back in the ghetto that all was fine. A special isolated Theresienstadt family camp was set up at Auschwitz-Birkenau, quarantine camp B2B. And a six-month moratorium on murders of anyone from Theresienstadt was imposed by Himmler. Six months that end now in March 1944. Now, Around 4,000 Jews from Theresienstadt held at Auschwitz must die to make room for the next transport in the liquidation plan. It begins with a visit by SS Obersturmbahnführer Adolf Eichmann in charge of deportations on February 27th and 28th. At B2B, 
Dr. Leo Janowitz, the former head of the Central Secretariat in the Theresienstadt ghetto, and Freddy Hirsch, the teacher and youth leader we met in September of last year, report to him. Eichmann also talks to Miriam Edelstein. He tells her that her husband, Jakob Edelstein, the former highest elder of the ghetto in Theresienstadt, is most likely in Germany. In reality, Edelstein and his closest staff are held in the Auschwitz jail, Block 11, since December. As he departs, Eichmann is satisfied that the illusion can be maintained and the murders can proceed. The formal decision is taken on March 5th. That day, the people held in B2B are given postcards dated forward to the 25th, 26th, and 27th of March. They are instructed to write to family and friends that all is well. A rumor has been spread that they will soon all be transferred to a labor camp. That camp is rumored to be far less harsh than B2B. The transport is supposedly to happen soon. When on March 8th the transports haven't begun, the prisoners start to voice louder and louder fears that something is wrong. That morning, the IG Farben subsidiary company Degish delivers 210 kilos of Cyclone B gas pellets for which they will send an invoice to the amount of 1,050 Reichsmark. In the early part of the day, Freddy Hirsch finds out about the murder plan. To silence him, he is isolated in the camp hospital. Unable to face the coming events, he commits suicide. The camp leader of Auschwitz II, Birkenau, who is responsible for the smooth implementation of the action, calls the SS camp doctor, SS Hauptsturmführer Dr. Heinz Thilo, for help. He sends in one of his doctors with some nurses and a random collection of medicines and medical instruments. They make rounds through the barracks, examining the inmates and inquiring about their health. This visit reassures the people waiting for their transport. In the course of the visit, 70 identical twins are singled out and transferred to quarantine camp B2A. They are to bypass the gas chambers and instead be subject to human experimentation by Dr. Josef Mengele. The prisoners are now told to pack any belongings they have been able to hold on to. They will be allowed to bring them to their new location. At 8 p.m., a camp curfew is put in place. A larger number of SS men and the political department arrive at B2B with couples and block supervisors they know they can trust. Half an SS company with dogs surround the camp. Around 10 p.m., 12 trucks covered with tarpaulins arrive up. The Jews are asked to leave the heavy luggage in the barracks and promised it will be taken to the train. In order to preserve the external appearance and tranquility, each canopy flatbed is loaded with no more than 40 people each time. As they drive off, the trucks do not turn left towards the crematoria, but make a right turn, giving the impression that they are driving to the station. Then they take several detours through the camp complex, confusing their human cargo as to their destination. First, the men are taken to crematorium 3, then the women and children to crematorium 2. The transports take several hours. Around 2 a.m., the waiting victims become restless, and in one of the blocks, they begin to sing a Czech folk song. In the next block, the singing catches on. This worries the SS men, who shut the singing down, firing warning shots in the air. They threaten to cancel the transports if the singing resumes. When the victims arrive at the crematoria, they have been set up to maintain the illusion that they are about to go to the train. Only when they are ordered to undress do they realize what is about to happen. Then they are soon alone with the Sonderkommando, the Jewish forced handlers of the gas chambers and crematoria. In defiance, the walking dead sing the Jewish anthem, the Hatikva, the Czechoslovak national anthem, folk songs, and the international. When the sun rises behind the lead-colored skies over Auschwitz on March 9, 1944, 3,791 Czechoslovak men, women, and children of Jewish ethnicity have been murdered by gas, their corpses desecrated to harvest hair and gold teeth. During the next hours, body after body is loaded into the elevators that give on the furnaces of the crematoria, where they are reduced to smoke and ash.
Never forget. Thank you.